Okay, Dina. Okay, you want roll, Georgina, or would you like protocols? No, we'll do roll after this. It's part of the introductions. Let's just go ahead and hit the highlights for the web, uh, webinar protocols. Okay, general questions can be asked in the Q&A box at any time during the meeting today. Um, at the end of each agenda item, the speaker or co-chair will call for questions. Please use your raise hand feature to uh, join the question queue. Uh, if you're joining via phone today, star nine will raise your hand to join the question queue. And if you join via phone, star six to mute and unmute yourself, please. When you're called upon, please state your name and agency, organization, or special interest group, and you'll have two minutes to speak. If you have any technical issues, Hector will drop either my information or his information into the um, chat box, for, and you can feel free to call us, text us, or email us. Great, thanks, Dina. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to, um, Brett at this point, supervisor, and we can go ahead and start the introductions and review the meeting minutes. Brett? Yeah, so uh, for introductions, or um, everyone that was, uh, is there anyone new um, that was not here the last time that'd like to introduce themselves? Do you want Dina to do a roll call? Yeah, let's do a roll call. That's okay. okay. Sounds good. Okay. Are there a Chamber of Commerce? Debbie Bray. MVP Realty, John Reed. I'm here. Red Barn Cafe owner, Lisa Soroyan. Visit Yosemite Madera County, Rhonda Salisbury. I'm here. City of Chowchilla, Mayor Palmer. City of Chowchilla, Rod Pruitt. I'm here. And I'm here too, Diana Palmer, sorry. Thank you. City of Chowchilla. John Reed here, sorry. Thanks, John. Jason Rogers. I'm here. City of Madera, Council Member Rodriguez. Here. City of Madera, Mayor Garcia. City of Madera, Arnaldo Rodriguez. Here. City of Madera, Keith Hilmu. City of Madera, Ellen Bitter. I'm here and I wanna report that Keith was having to restart his computer. He does intend to participate. Great, thanks, Ellen. Valley Children's Hospital, Tim Curley. I am here. Great, thank you. Madera County Public Health Department, Sarah Bose. Here. And Supervisor Frazier. Here. Supervisor Poitras. Yes. Madera County CAO, Jay Varney. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, I am here. Thank you. Madera County Planning Department, Matt Traver. Present. And Madera County Public Works Department, Jared Carter. I'm here, good afternoon. Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability, Madeline Harris. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And Camarena Health Center, Paulo Soros. And Nicole Mesquita is here today. Great, thanks, Nicole. Thanks. Madera County Farm Bureau, Christina Bexted. <laughs> And Creekside Farming, Devinder Mahill. Madera County Superintendent of Schools, Opie Roar. Madera C Community College, Dr. Angel Reyna. Cal Fire, Matt Watson. Here. And Caltrans, Michael Navarro. Hello, all here. And Building Industry Association, Michael Prandini. Here. Madera County Economic Development Commission, Bobby Kahn. 
and Tehipiti chapter, chapter of the Sierra Club, Bill Filbo. MCTC, Patricia Taylor. Afternoon here. And Central California Labor Council, Mike Lopez. Hello, everybody. This is Mike Lopez, and I'm here. Thanks, Mike. And Central California Labor Council alternate, Chuck Riojas. Social Service Transportation Advisory Council, Frank Simonis. I'm here. Active Transportation Advocate, Jeffrey Wheeler. Good afternoon, everyone. San Joaquin Regional Rail Commission, Paul Herman. San Joaquin Regional Rail Commission, Dan Levitt. Our student representative, Madera Community College, Jonathan Stromer. Our citizens advocate, Derek Robinson. And our citizens advocate, com community advocate, Donald Tolley. That concludes roll call. So after the roll call, that looks like that brings us to our 3.30 end of uh, meeting. Um, <laughs> so it's good seeing everybody here today. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for doing that. Um, all right, so item two, uh, we're going to review MCTC funding allocation disbursement process uh, and current funding allocation by mode. And I believe Troy McNeil will be taking this. We still have the minutes. I'm sorry, Supervisor oh. Fraser. We still need to approve the minutes from October 21st. I'm sorry. Don't have that on my head. All right. Um, I'll, I'll make a motion for approval. We have a second. This is Tim Curley. I'll second. All right. Uh, do we need a roll call? Or I think uh, what we'll do is just uh, no. does anybody um, uh, have any objections to or additions to the meeting minutes? Um, uh, if not, well, uh, Michael Prendini? Yes, uh, I need to abstain. I was absent at that meeting. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, anybody, <laughs> excuse me, anybody else? John Reed, same thing. John, I think you're on mute. It's, uh, it's like John is calling in, can anyone unmute him? Star six is supposed to unmute. Right, star six. John, if you can hit star six, you're muted. I see your hand raised. Let me start to All right. Uh, so, is there uh, any um, objections? If not, uh, we will take that as uh, approval. It looks like John is unmuted now, Brett. This is Rose, if you want to call on him. <laughs> John, did you have a question? No, no, I was just absent, so I will have to abstain. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, we'll let the record reflect that uh, John Reed and Michael Prandini abstain uh, from this vote. Um, right now, we'll move on to item two. Okay, we have asked each of the local agencies, uh, the city of Chachilla, the city of Madera, and Madera County, to present their modal needs, uh, talking about all their transportation efforts uh, with the current measure as well as their modal needs moving into the future. Uh, the first one that we would like to have present is Jason Rogers from the city of Chowchilla. Um, and we really appreciate them all working on pulling these presentations together. It's very great. It's very good information for all of us to have as we start to look at what the measure should be, how the measure should be formed for the future. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jason Rogers, uh, Public Works Director with the city of Chowchilla. Jason? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, as stated, I'm Jason Rogers. I'm the Public Works Director for the City of Chowchilla, and I'll just give a brief presentation and then turn it over for uh, either questions um, at the end of this or, uh, I, I don't know, maybe after all of them are completed. Um, next slide, please. So uh, Measure A, Measure T funds. Um, 
have been used to make safety improvements. Uh, and sorry, that's a typo there. We have 65 miles of roadways throughout the city of Chowchilla, but through Measure A and Measure T, we've been able to make uh, improvements to uh, approximately 12 miles of roadways throughout the city of Chowchilla um, in order to connect our residents, relieve congestion, and safely uh, transport our community through the area. Next slide, please. And so this is just uh, some of the um, uh, completed projects that we've done through Measure A and Measure T. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of reconstruction, rehabilitation of streets. Uh, we've had some um, overlays for preventative maintenance um, and then um, in the way of transit, uh, bus purchases, uh, equipment purchases in order to uh, continue doing maintenance on our roads. Um, but overall, the focus has been on reconstruction and rehabilitation and preventative maintenance of existing roads. Uh, next, please. So current and planned projects that we have going on is uh, general street maintenance and repairs such as potholes, overlays, um, ADA and pedestrian improvements throughout various locations in the city. Um, we're currently working on a Humboldt storm drain uh, project and road rehabilitation project that uh, we expect to go out to bid uh, this spring and be in construction uh, this summer. Uh, we're currently working with Caltrans regarding the uh, State Route 99-233 interchange project, also known as roundabouts. And uh, uh, next year, we hope to be in construction regarding uh, Chowchilla Boulevard rehabilitation and in design for the Avenue 24 uh, reconstruction off of uh, State Route 99 and um, additional uh, bus shelter purchases and installation of those. And uh, those are just a few pictures of some of the areas uh, that we're doing. Uh, you can see the roundabouts, you can see uh, uh, an overview of the Humboldt storm drain project, which is a red marking right there. And then our uh, ongoing uh, uh, street maintenance and, and repair. Next, please. So in regards to future needs, uh, I've provided a, cup, uh, a picture of our current uh, PCI condition. This is pavement condition index. Uh, and our big focus is on preventative maintenance, uh, having the ability to apply uh, proper treatments on, on roads that need it, um, when they need it. Um, Overall, the city's PCI is 65, which is on par with uh, the state average right now. Um, recently, when we did our uh, pavement, pavement management program, it identified a need of about $2.1 million annually um, in order to just maintain the current condition um, of the roads, that 65 PCI. And what we currently have with Measure T and gas tax funds um, currently all together is approximately 960,000 annually. Um, so there's a big shortfall there. And because of that, we anticipate that PCI um, to continue dropping um, unless additional funds are, are allocated. And if Measure T goes away, then uh, a large chunk of that uh, annual uh, funding goes away too. Um, we also want to focus on, you know, CADEX transit improvements, uh, such as uh, ele electric electrification of the uh, buses and the charging infrastructure needed for that. Um, that's uh, a goal of the state and um, one that we need to comply with. And then um, additional bike pedestrian facilities uh, throughout the city to encourage more multi multimodal transportation um, throughout uh, the area. 
um, including fill-in gaps of missing sidewalk, ADA ramps, um, and additional uh, uh, bike lanes. And uh, let's see, next slide, please. And like I said, short, sweet, um, and I'm willing to take any questions if anybody has them right now, or um, it, up to you guys if you wanna wait until after everybody else has presented. Um, yeah, I think we'll go through, um, unless anyone has a burning question right now, we'll just go through all of these presentations and then uh, take questions at the end. Thank you. Okay, great. Next up is the city of Madeira. I know Keith Helmuth and um, Ellen Bitter are going to be, have been working together on this presentation. So I'll turn it over to them at this point. Thank you, Georgina. Um, this is Ellen Bitter with the city of Madeira. I'll go ahead and run through our slides and then Keith and I will be available for any questions or comments. Next slide. This first slide, I didn't put together a list of projects completed with our measures because that alone would take several slides. So I decided to just um, show everything on a map of what's been completed. Uh, these green streets highlighted are all of the improvements that we achieved with the Measure A program. Um, I will say the city was um, very foresighted when the measure was passed. They actually brought on a gentleman, if you remember Les Jorgensen, um, to kind of take the lead on implementing and delivering a lot of these projects. And so that helped the city have a very successful program through Measure A. Next slide. These are the projects that have complete, been completed with the Measure T program. Uh, these are primarily roadway uh, repaving or uh, roadway major in improvements um, on our collectors and our arterials. Um, the street maintenance funds through Measure T are allocated directly to our annual maintenance budget. So, um, that is incorporated into the annual maintenance program with enhanced uh, pavement maintenance strategies such as chip seals and crack fills, pothole patching, et cetera. Next slide. Uh, these are the two tier one projects uh, that the city was able to build with Measure T and partnering with the state uh, transportation improvement program funds. Uh, they are the new overcrossing of Ellis Avenue um, and the, Schnorr, the realignment at Schnorr and Granada. Um, and um, it was a project that started in Measure A. And um, by the time we had the plans ready, we were into Measure T, thankfully, and that project was able to move forward. Uh, we also improved the interchange and the bridge at the 4th Street overcrossing. So that entire 4th Street corridor from um, say I and 4th Street across 99 all the way to Lake Street uh, was improved to a full arterial uh, roadway there. Um, and then on the next slide, these are all of the projects from both measures and I have highlighted um, with the gray dashed lines um, regionally significant projects. We have the um, the gateway overcrossing of 99, those were carryovers and they happened kind of between the transition and measure A and measure T, um, really opened up the roadway network for all modes of travel over 99. Uh, we improved the off ramp near the hospital at Almond. Uh, we widened the uh, Madera Avenue 145 bridge over 99 and made significant improvements there. Um, and again, as I noted, the 4th Street uh, corridor. Um, early on in Measure A, that's where we saw um, the Schnorr Bridge was constructed. Um, when I first started in 1992, there was no bridge there, and uh, Measure A uh, helped put that in. And then also, uh, we did have um, some, I, I see the Granada Bridge is highlighted. I think that was a uh, just a, a paving overlay there. And then of course the whole Ellis overcrossing. So um, as you can see, um, since 1990 when Measure A was implemented, uh, the city of Madeira has been able to utilize and it has helped kept 
keep our streets um, in great condition um, on our coll collectors and arterials. Um, I do want to note that on a lot of these projects, um, they are more than just paving. Whenever we did widen a road to full standards, it included sidewalk, uh, accessibility upgrades, and if they were on a bicycle network, bicycle lanes were installed uh, when we could put those in. Okay, next slide. Within the other programs of Measure T, we've used those funds to match grants. And um, here are a few highlights. Um, we were able to um, install a sidewalk specific project near Washington Elementary School. And uh, we recently completed um, a project in Madera, um, just east of Gateway Drive. It kind of feeds uh, the uh, Rotary Park uh, corridor and uh, we that was match funds to the congestion mitigation program and then also measure T funded almost a third of the new trail project that connects um, the uh, gateway drive it goes under gateway drive underneath the Union Pacific Railroad and connects on the east side of Madera so it, it was the the gap the missing piece in that trail um, going all the way uh, along the Fresno River from east to west. Next slide, please. Again, uh, Measure T was used to match um, various grants. Um, early on, we partnered um, with uh, the school district used, and um, used Measure T funds and congestion mitigation funds to build an alternative fuel uh, facility at the uh, Madera Unified site. Um, and then we also completed a project that built 42 new bus shelters. And Measure T also participated in the new transit center that was recently constructed. Okay, next slide. I'll move forward into what we see um, coming up as our needs um, uh, for, for the immediate needs and also beyond that. Um, so we talked about uh, bridge widening that occurred in the earlier measures. We do see the need to widen Gateway Drive, Lake Street and Granada Drive. Those are all arterial roadways that will not meet um, near project, near term projected traffic or future traffic. Um, we use, we would utilize uh, measure funds for helping uh, relieve congestion at um, our various intersections. Uh, there are also gaps in our current network that need to be uh, remedied. The Almond Avenue uh, near the um, Madera South High School and some new uh, subdivisions going in, um, it is in, not complete between Stadium and Pine, and we hope to be able to uh, close that gap. Um, notably, the Westbury Bridge is also um, planned in our network, and although um, Development impact fees, we have been collecting for that. Um, likely, they may or not be enough to fully fund that project. And um, so we see that as a, a very soon need for the city. Um, continuing to improve our collectors and arterial streets. Um, one of the projects that was in the original Measure T is not, it, it kind of fell off the list just due to funding and that is Gateway Drive. Um, there's two segments of it. There are it, from the 99 on the south end through town up to Yosemite, that um, would be a shared project with Caltrans. And then from Yosemite north to Avenue or 16 um, and widening on that roadway as well. Um, right now, as you've heard, the Madera County Transportation Commission is working on their regional transportation plan and we're developing project priorities. City of Madera had 364 projects on that list. So I just pulled a sampling of some eligible projects. Um, Adele Street is a two lane, it's really a rural road, but it's becoming urban in nature that needs to be widened and improved with all facilities, sidewalks, bike lanes, everything. Um, Ellis Street, same thing. We see a lot of traffic there. Um, that's going to need to uh, accommodate that with the growth in the new high school. Uh, Tozier Street 
These are all fringe roads that were built, um, county roads at one time, they've been taken over by the city and um, they're gonna need to be reconstructed. And uh, Lake Street as well and Sunset are also corridors that will need attention. Um, I did wanna point out that um, we do collect impact fees and we do plan on new development paving, paying their way, but um, growth on existing network infrastructure, that's where funds such as these uh, really help the city maintain those facilities. Next slide. So we have completed a similar pavement condition study um, as Chowchilla. And the city of Madera has 73 miles of arterials and collectors that we do need to maintain. Um, right now we're spending about $2.6 million for those types of projects. Um, however, our backlog would still remain at about 60 million um, to complete, to maintain those and bring all those roads up to an acceptable level of pavement condition. And, um, just to maintain projects at a recommended PCI rating of 68, uh, the city would need approximately $6 million per year, uh, strictly dedicated to uh, roadway, roadway rehabilitation. Next slide. Of course, in addition to paving, um, we have identified um, through our active transportation plan, um, 18 pedestrian projects were noted along with 37 bikeway enhancement projects. Uh, we also have a downtown plan that has many transportation features for multimodal accessibility identified and um, we'll be looking for funding for those projects as well. Next slide. Uh, as in transit, um, as Jason mentioned, um, the electrification of the fleet as, and also charging stations, that is a need that's um, identified. And um, so that is a goal of our uh, program. And then I do understand that we are currently in the process of developing a um, Madera transit plan and it's, it's kind of an overhaul of our transit program. So um, there aren't specific uh, projects identified yet, but we do anticipate um, major changes to the program and um, with a measure in place that would enhance our ability to deliver that. And on the next slide um, is the schedule for that study. And that is, um, Right now where the blue arrow is, that's where we are on that transit study. And we do expect a plan to come out, um, a draft plan in 2022, and then the final plan in 2023. So um, I do believe they actually are in public input phases for that. So um, I would encourage anyone that's interested if you aren't already involved in that to um, reach out to our transit division um, to participate. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, very good presentation. Um, and now we'll move into the county. Uh, Jared Carter with our roundabout uh, behind him. Be careful, it's dangerous. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Yes, that is a beautiful roundabout in the background there. Um, so much like you've heard from uh, both the city of Chowchilla and the city of Madera, um, we have uh, been doing a lot of work, had a lot under construction with uh, the past measure A and the current measure T. Um, the next slide gives a list of uh, a good list of those programs that we have completed or those projects that we've completed with the funding. Um, essentially, you know, this represents a little over uh, right around 45 miles of roadway that have been uh, rehabilitated or reconstructed. Um, uh, admittedly, that is a very small piece of our 1500 mile network. Um, however, um, uh, with rural roads um, and county roads, uh, some of which have 
you know, been built back in the 1800s. Um, you can imagine the construction of those roads weren't exactly um, uh, all that great. And so uh, m most of the time we find ourselves having to um, do full rehab and reconstruction, which are co more costly than, um, you know, the preventative maintenance type work. Um, but nonetheless, you know, we've we've um, worked very hard at trying to come up with, uh, uh, you know, um, both uh, efficient and um, uh, also um, uh, effective measures. Um, the rehabilitation, for example, um, on many of our roads, we're doing what's called a full depth reclamation um, and utilizing materials that are there, um, enhancing those materials and, um, uh, you know, putting them back into place, which is uh, also cost savings um, and stretches our dollars, but it also environmentally is very good because we eliminate uh, quite a bit of truck traffic and hauling and material in and out of the site. Um, so those are some things that we're trying to do to, like I said, stretch the dollars um, and be more uh, efficient with our funding. Um, next slide, please. Um, uh, I mentioned, uh, you know, we have a lot of rehabs. We also have been doing some some maintenance, preventative maintenance um, on those roads that have uh, are in better shape and can receive those types of treatments. Um, and again, um, ideally, uh, you know, these the cost for these um, treatments is far less than uh, reconstruction or, or rehabilitation. Um, and so um, you know, the goal is to get our network into a condition where we can be doing preventative maintenance and stretching our dollars even further to preserve the network um, as opposed to having to do full reconstruction. So um, you probably heard people talk about fix it first. Um, those are some of the things that, um, you know, we're trying to do to get our, our existing network into a better shape to where we can um, utilize those funds more in a preventative maintenance measure. Um, a way in, rather than having to reconstruct and rehabilitate roadways. Um, and then a big piece of that, of course, as you've heard from both the cities, is our pavement management system, which has been a, a tremendous tool uh, to help us evaluate the condition of our network and, and plan out, you know, where we're going to use those funds, uh, what the best use of those funds are, um, and the you know the phrase you hear is the right treatment at the right time um at the on the right road um, and so really that's that's a huge tool in being able to figure that out and do that um in the most effective way uh, next slide so some other modes that we've worked on uh with the measure t um you know we've worked with some of the transit stuff um uh pedestrian facilities uh, traffic circulation, uh, including that roundabout that is in the background behind me, um, and um, and then also our bridge program. Um, we have uh, 142 bridges that we maintain. Um, many of our uh, bridges are in pretty poor shape, um, and uh, thankfully we just uh, saw that the new infrastructure uh, bill that was passed or uh, the act um, does include a, a good in, uh, increase in bridge funding. I believe it was around uh, 400% or something like that, if I remember correctly. Um, and so, uh, you know, being able to have Measure T uh, available to match those programs along with, you know, other programs like the congestion mitigation, air quality, um, and those sorts of things um, is, is a tremendous uh, help for our region to be able to leverage those other dollars. Next slide. So what does the future look like? Uh, yeah, you probably remember Back to the Future when they said we weren't going to need roads. Um, unfortunately, that's not exactly the case, um, you know, for the foreseeable future anyways. Um, wish we could all think that Doc Brown was right and we weren't going to need those roads, but um, certainly going to need those. Um, so obviously we need to be planning to take care of the network. And as I mentioned, um, uh, we have a significant amount of work ahead of us um, for uh, not only getting our, our network into better shape, but also preserving that network. Um, so 
as far as some of the regionally significant projects, and anyway, I've just listed a couple here, um, but these are some of the ones that are are probably higher on the list in terms of uh, improving circulation throughout our region. Um, and some of these are already in the works as far as planning um, and developing uh, the 41 expansion project is currently uh, at least a portion of our first phases of that is already in design. Um, and again, we're leveraging funds to try and get all these projects done um, and hopefully have the opportunity to do that with this new infrastructure funding that's coming through. Um, uh, some other things uh, related to modal, um, but Eric County connection, obviously uh, enhancing the service as well as some of the capital costs. And as you heard both of the other agencies, electrification of the fleet is going to be a high priority uh, to meet the requirements that have come from the Air Board and the deadlines that we have to meet for that. Um, safety circulation projects, um, really um, we have our systemic safety analysis report that was completed and we're looking to be able to uh, you know, implement a lot of those projects um, and um, leverage again other funding, uh, highway safety improvement program funding and various other sources to be able to do those. Um, and then we have the, the regional ATP which uh, identifies our our bicycle and pedestrian routes that we certainly want to get get to work on and, and be able to uh, add to those or expand those networks to create those opportunities for the community to uh, take those modes of transportation. Um, one thing on here that I've noted for us is the terminal access routes and um, not a lot of people really know about that or maybe don't know what it is. Um, uh, basically, it's really trying to uh, uh, establish and identify uh, truck routes throughout our county so that we can make improvements that allow for those trucks to, to drive those specific routes um, and, and traverse those routes. There's certain requirements they have to meet. Um, but what that would do is that would help relieve some of the impact on some of the other roads throughout our county, um, being able to focus the truck traffic in certain areas um, and establish those routes so that uh, you know the larger truck traffic is being uh, uh, centered or focused on those routes um, will help uh, relieve that that impact to other areas that might be getting affected by truck traffic that aren't necessarily in the shape to be able to take it. Um, um, and then of course the preventive maintenance. And I've talked about that. You know, um, uh, you heard the other agencies talk about their pavement condition index. Um, the county is started out as a 44 a few years ago. We've actually dropped down to about a, a 42, I believe, at this point. Um, uh, we have been doing work, but um, again, a very large network, a lot to get done. It's going to take a heavy, heavy lift for us to uh, be able to uh, fund all that we need um, to both maintain that payment condition. Um, but also, you know, hopefully increase it and, and bring that number up. Um, I believe our, our uh, analysis in 2019 showed uh, we needed about a $16.5 million um, figure annually just to maintain the network at a PCI of 44. So um, we're, we're sitting more around an eight to $9 million uh, amount that we have available to us. So, um, you know, again, that creates a, uh, a deferred maintenance that continues to increase. Um, and for the county, that's in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So um, being able to have the funding to invest in the system now um, and help, you know, uh, improve and, and bring that PCI up uh, is really saving a tremendous amount of money in the long run as we move forward. So with that, um, I'll uh, finish my presentation and be available for questions. Thank you, Jared. Um, thank you, Alan, and thank you, Jason. Um, are there any questions um, from any committee members uh, of uh, any of the presenters? Uh, Madeline, I see your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I have a few comments and a few questions. Um, I guess I'll start with some comments and then finish with some questions so I can hopefully get some answers. So um, 
First off, I guess I'll start with, I, I'm feeling a little bit concerned that I'm seeing um, expansion, like roadway expansion projects being framed as safety projects, because we've seen in the past that this is not the case. Um, and for instance, like with, I'll just use Highway 99 as an example, um, you know, sometimes we hear that expansion will make the road safer, but we know that induced demand is a reality. And so if we build the infrastructure, the vehicles will come. And oftentimes with a lot of Madera County roadways, we see that the vehicles that come are heavy duty vehicles that cause more damage to the roadways and do not actually improve safety. Um, so what I don't want to see is um, capacity expanding projects be framed as safety projects or be included at all. Um, and then I would also say that it would be nice to see more details around some of the projects, particularly in the county um, for active transportation and transit improvements because I saw a lot of details about exactly which intersections and roadways um, needed maintenance or um, are being, you know, uh, I don't want to say prioritized, but considered for capacity expansion. But I didn't see a lot of specifics about what exactly is in the works to be planned for active transportation and multimodal projects. Um, and then I wanted to, so I'll get into my questions. Um, I have two questions. One is if the pavement management system is being utilized to prioritize which roads get repaired, what is the prioritization criteria for um, transit and active transportation projects? Because um, I'd like to understand better how certain projects are getting prioritized versus others. And then, um, the other question I have is, can we get any analysis about the disrepair or damage to roads that's being caused by heavy duty goods movement or agricultural equipment? Because one of the things that I do hear from residents a lot and want to uplift is that through t sales tax measures like Measure T, like the general public and taxpayers are basically subsidizing industry by paying for the impacts the industry is causing on their roadways. And we don't want to have to, you know, make Madera County and taxpayers foot the bill for impacts that they're not causing. So I'd like to see some analysis on that. Thank you for those comments. Uh, uh, do we have anything that, um, uh, or how we prioritize those? A lot of times that goes through um, our unmet transit needs. Uh, uh, anywhere else, anyone wanna jump in? Yes, this is Georgina um, and Dylan can follow up with this as well. Um, as part of the project prioritization study, uh, we have identified um, criteria, prioritization criteria for each mode of transportation. And even within the modes, there are different criteria that apply for maintenance projects versus uh, mobility enhancement projects or capacity increasing projects. So um, that prioritization study included a long set of um, criteria that, um, that addresses each mode of transportation. And I'll let Dylan further explain. Dylan? Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, you are correct that we look at each mode and we look at a, this uh, various set of criteria for each one, uh, including potential impacts. Um, and, and there is there is a heavy weighting towards that process too, towards projects that can demonstrate uh, beneficial or uh, less less harm or, or reduce harmful impacts of those projects as much as possible. Those are the projects that are going to be prioritized higher. And those projects will be uh, going through the prioritization process um, as part of the 2022 RTP development. Um, so uh, they're being looked at now and uh, MCTC is working with the local agencies to uh, evaluate those projects and they'll be incorporated into the uh, RTP update. In terms... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Um, 
In terms of the, um, does anyone want to speak to her comment regarding uh, roadway? Yeah, yeah um, I, was, I was gonna- Expansion uh, and safety. I was gonna speak to that too, because um, so, you know, these roads were um, built for a much lower population than we even have right now. Um, and they need to grow. We have not grown at the same rate that uh, the Bay Area and, and Southern California have, which have uh, created a lot of the adverse uh, reasoning for uh, capacity or expansion projects. Um, we don't have the capacity to even take the traffic that we have now, uh, let alone anything that's going to be um, added uh, in the future, just naturally. Just building uh, or just widening the road doesn't create um, more trips. It's the number of people and, and the use of them for various different reasons. Um, the, in terms of footing the bill for goods movement, every, um, all transportation is, um, uh, you know, subsidized and by uh, the public. Um, goods movement is a large part of that, as we see right now, especially with all the issues in terms of supply chain and getting um, goods to market or getting it to uh, even to the people that um, you represent, Madeline, that, that need those goods that are now costing, you know, 50%, 100% more than what they did just a year or two years ago. So if we continue to uh, disinvest in uh, those goods movement corridors and um, allow them to uh, move goods uh, in a um, in a manner that uh, gets it to market faster. People are going to uh, really start to be hurt in the pocketbook, not just on the taxes that they pay uh, to subsidize those uh, those corridors. Uh, and I will. Will say, oh, go ahead, Georgina. You I will say that. I will say that safety is one of the major concerns of Caltrans and each of the local agencies when it comes to looking at um, how to uh, specifically address some of the improvements that are needed on these facilities. I'm sure Ellen and Keith and, and uh, Jason and uh, others uh, can back me up on that. It's not just providing for capacity, it's providing for increased safety along a particular corridor. Um, anyone want to follow up with that a little bit? Uh, no, it looks like uh, Mike Navarro's hand is up. Great. Yeah, for that. I, I, think, uh, I think he'll probably be able to answer that. Uh, not that Tim Curley wouldn't be able to, but I think that uh, Mike Navarro <laughs> probably has a little bit of an inside track on Tim on this one. There yeah, you go. I, I just want to jump in on, on the 9-9 on the conversation. And um, Madeline, totally understand where you're coming from. And as you know, the state goes forward, you know, we're trying to get more tools in our toolbox and not look at just gravitating toward, straight towards widening projects. And so for the 99 corridor of this area, obviously we know that the 12 to 17 were just built. Um, the 712 was more of a, 712 is more of a gap closure project, I'd say. And, and we share your concern. We're not trying to do projects that do induce demand, but we're kind of balancing needs of goods movement and safety. And I do know when we, we start running the models, it does show there are some safety benefits to adding the lanes of some of these sections where the bottlenecks exist. So I think there are some safety benefits. Does it classify in the traditional sense of the safety project? By definition, probably not, but there are safety benefits to a project like that. Um, one of the reasons why, you know, I've been supportive of the 7 to 12 project for adding capacity there is that it says there's no really other parallel route. So I think as we start looking at real data, when we compare other segments we've done, you don't see the same results of induced demand you might see on some of the tools we had before, it's like the NCST calculator. Um, but there is, well, there will be some increase in due demand if you look at some of the modeling. But as we go forward, we will have to look at these projects and, and look at different alternatives, and we will be forced to do VMT mitigation if we do end up with an opportunity where we feel that that is the end result of widening. And, and you may have heard we are moving forward with some stakeholder engagement. I'll, I'll, I'd be happy to have a separate conversation with you on that, on how we look at 99 as a corridor and how we envision that in the future and opportunities for, for rail and passenger rail and other ways to move goods along the corridor. So we are open to those ideas and suggestions. And, and like I said, as we go through the process, there'll be uh, substantial stakeholder engagement, open to ideas. And like I said, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you if you'd like at some point.
Um, uh, Mike, there's a, uh, a question from her in the chat as well. Oh, too. sorry. Uh, Tim? Yeah, thank you, Supervisor. Appreciate it. Happy to help back up Michael, although I would completely fumble it. But anyway, always happy to be be helpful. It's good. Um, He's not that good on healthcare, so yeah, uh, yeah. I'm probably above you here. All right. Exactly. So, um, one that was uh, a, a really informative presentation. I really had no idea uh, the extent to which both the Measure A and Measure T dollars have been used and the uh, uh, amount of work. Uh, and the amount of improvements and additional infrastructure they've created. It's, and I'm, I'm assuming we'll be sharing that as we um, uh, promote uh, the new Measure T initiative so the public can, can see visually, the visuals are really good, uh, just how those dollars have been helpful. And um, moving forward, I, I do think it's important, uh, building on Madeline's comment, to really uh, explain further and build out um, the work around active transportation or alternative transportation. And I think that'll be an important part of our conversation with respect to the future measure T allocation. So I just wanna make sure that um, we are spending, you know, as much time or, you know, an appropriate amount of time on that element of this uh, um, as, as we do on, on the other pieces, um, knowing it's all critical and all important. Thank you, Tim. Um, looks like we have a question uh, from uh, one of the attendees, Leticia. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. OK, awesome. Um, yeah, so my name is Leticia. I am also here with Leadership Council. Um, thank you all so much for that presentation. It was very informative. Um, some kind of questions that I have, I guess I'm, I'm trying to really understand you all, like the decisions that you all are making. Um, so one of the things that, oh, well, well, first of all, Michael, I would love to talk to you after because I'm really curious about where you're getting um, your research and your information on kind of like the safety aspect of broadening um, the freeway. Um, because I've, I've read a lot of things that contradict the safety aspect of it, but maybe I'm just not looking at the right information. So I definitely want to know more about that. Um, the other thing is like, okay, so we're talking about investing in communities, but most of the slides kind of show investments in Madera City. Um, and so I guess when we're talking about, you know, investing in communities, I'm, I'm just kind of curious as to why we aren't investing in communities like La Viña or Fairmead, because um, those communities also pay taxes and they also pay into Measure T. So I'm curious about that. But in addition to that, I know there was a comment made about um, how we're trying to, uh, you know, trying to repair the, the roads for um, the good market. Um, I, I probably mispronounced that. I apologize for that. Um, and I guess with that, I, I am wondering, like, there's a lot of, there's not a lot of, there's one store in La Viña, I'm thinking, and in Fairmead, my understanding is that there's no stores at all. So these, these things that you all are investing in for these good market, like the goods market is not really helping the communities that need assistance and that have already suffered from historical disinvestment so I guess I'm just kind of confused about it all oh and by the way I'm new so this is all new to me too um and I guess yeah I'm just trying to understand where you all are coming from uh, thank you Latisa um uh, one of the um uh the the first uh, answer to one of your questions in terms of the slides uh, so the reason you saw a lot of the investment in the city of Madera was because that was uh the city of Madera's presentation and what they utilized Measure T, uh, what they utilized Measure A for, and the projects that were specific to the city of Madera. And so that's why you um, you saw that, um, as well as the city of Chowchilla, then the county of Madera. Um, I see Supervisor Poitras, uh, his hand is raised, but I just wanted to point that part out. I hope I didn't uh, step on his toes. No, thank you, Supervisor. In fact, uh, based on Leticia's questions, I think that, uh, this is a, we could spend the next two 
hours answering that question. So what I would suggest is ha having an offline uh, meeting with Leticia to, to uh, help her understand uh, the difference between funding in the city and the funding in the county and funding in special districts and so forth. It sounds like it would be a worthwhile thing to do rather than to uh, you know spend the time on this phone call so that we can be more thorough as far as an answer goes, because it seems like there's some very baseline questions there, and uh, that that discussion needs to uh, uh, to be a little bit more uh, have a lot more information. So, what I would suggest staff do is to mm -hmm. contact Leticia and to uh, set up a meeting where uh, we can sit down with her and uh, go over this whole program and explain how it works. Sounds good. It's a great idea. And I hear you, um, Supervisor Poitras, and appreciate the willingness to follow up. I do want to flag that just for purposes of like public participation, that if we're not getting a clear sense of where the investment is going and why being steering committee members and being paid advocates who are calling in, then I also think that it raises the question, how would we expect um, the general public to participate on the Measure T expenditure plan renewal. Um, so I do think that there is a benefit to having these conversations in a transparent public forum as well. Well, that's true. But a lot of, if you understand, Leticia's new um, with the county. I haven't, I think when I saw her in Chachola a couple of nights ago, that's the first time I've met her. And so, you know, there's a lot of people on this call that already understand, you know, what's going on. Uh, she doesn't. She's new to the organization and she needs to have, uh, you know, we, we need to spend our time with her so that she can explain and understand how to better represent uh, the constituents of Madera County. Because it's not going to happen, you know, as thoroughly as necessary on this particular call. And also, I mean, the, to point out the, um, there were very uh, thorough presentations that were made. Um, in terms of like going all the way back to uh, uh, in the 90s um, in regards to it. Uh, I mean, I've been in uh, the transportation world now for, I think I've been on MCTC for about 10 years now. And um, I could spend the full two hours asking about these programs. These are, they're um, extremely difficult to, uh, to get a grasp on. And, and uh, we'd like to, to help anybody who wants to come in and, and work with staff and, and understand this stuff better uh, uh, or available for that. Okay, any other questions? And, um, and then I, I think she had asked about, uh, you know, where Mike Navarro got his information. That would be from um, data uh, uh, that, is available to him through Caltrans, uh, which would uh, arguably have the most data available for transportation uh, in the state. Yeah, and I think her uh, and Michael talking as well would be good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have uh, um, Councilman Rodriguez. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just kind of wanted to uh, uh, follow up on that point. Um, you know, I know that we talk about uh, the importance of corridor, especially widening them when it comes to uh, 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 products and services from uh, farm to market. Um, and I think that was very uh, evident here with the 99 in our city of Madeira, where that created a bottleneck effect and certainly affects the air quality within the region, or well, especially within the city. Can't speak for Chowchilla, and I can't speak for the other uh, rural areas in the county, but certainly uh, I, I certainly see how that benefits our community. Now, that being said, um, the, there may be a disconnect in what our survey has, uh, um, our, what our survey has, uh, uh, has seen from our constituency is, you know, when they're looking at, at these measure T dollars, um, I guess, they want to have those dollars accounted for their um, their way of seeing things with those dollars, their roads, their actual tangible benefits that they can actually see. And, and at times, 
I know that the whining might not be there. They're more concerned about paving potholes and, and taking care of uh, sidewalks and what have you. Um, so th there may be a disconnect there. And I think we just have to do a better job of making sure that when we factor these particular projects, they were also factoring these comments coming from the constituency, wanting to see that uh, these dollars are accountable for, for those exact things that we're promoting. Um, and, and I know that uh, a, a good portion of the dollars may be used to leverage um, millions of dollars for projects that we've done for these big uh, corridors. And, and that's sad to say, but it's, you gotta pay to play. Um, I would just hope that uh, more of these dollars would be used for the, the, the needs within the community. And we'd find a different source of, of funds that would, uh, um, would be attributed to those big old corridors. And, and unfortunately, that's not the way it is today. People do pay gas tax, people do pay road tax. And now on top of that, here we are requesting that they pay also a sales tax that frankly funds a lot of these, uh, a lot of these projects. It's unfortunate, but I, I would like to see that we do um, we, we do resonate with these folks and we add those, we factor that in when, when determining these projects. Those are my comments, thank you. Thank you, and then there's a question from uh, John Reed. Have there been any efforts to form public-private partnerships to provide EV charging stations in the county, perhaps involving PG&E? Um, short answer is yes, and then uh, Jared, um, you know, uh, Jared or Dylan? Jared or Dylan? Can you follow up on that? I can't follow up directly on the the details of that question, but we are currently in the process of working on a region wide electric or zero emission vehicle uh, readiness and implementation plan where we're gonna be looking not just at opportunities such as the one you speak about in your comment and question, but you know what are the challenges on a community by community basis? And what are the things that we're really going to need to see an effective transition to a zero emission fleet in the future? Uh, we have looming mandates from the state that we, we wanna prepare for now and be best uh, suited to meet that challenge before us. And uh, coming up with solutions such as the one you provide, we're gonna need things like that and quite a bit more in our area. So we're in the process of identifying uh, all of our needs and a, a plan that we think can effectively help us achieve this goal. And, and this is Trisha, and in addition to um, EVs, for public-private partnership, we're always looking for those types of opportunities. We're looking at that potentially in the, um, in the mountain area when you're providing transit and having some of the hotels and um, local businesses contribute to travel into the Yosemite area or Bass Lake area and assist in that. So we're always looking for opportunities um, to for public-private partnerships. Also with, oh. with our uh, solar project uh, at the county, um, we had them include a couple of charging stations at our um, uh, parking garage uh, here in the county as well. And so we do continue to talk about that. I have uh, spoken with Nathan Alonzo from PG&E about um, some of those things too. So um, yes, we are working on some of those. Um, also, you know, uh, oh, Arnaldo, uh, you have oh. a question? Yeah. Can simply get a high, so simply to piggyback off of what you said, Chair uh, Frazier, the city of Madeira has a couple of charging stations in Verna City Hall that are available to the public. Um, there's only four of them, but it's a good start, I think, for the city. Yeah, especially right off of 99. It's yeah. Perfect. Uh, you know, and you start seeing them at different places. I know the vineyard has uh, um, put in a couple of charging stations uh, there as well. So I think you'll just keep on seeing them pop up at different places as people are starting to need them. Uh, Mayor Palmer? Um, I. I know that MCTC has worked on several different projects as far as um, air quality projects and um, some other safety projects, multimodal projects and studies. Um, was Measure T involved in any of those? We'd like to, Dylan, would that 
the me measure T is a, a funding component for for an array of different projects that are involved in some of our plans that we work on, including our our long range transportation plan that really has an account of of many different projects across many modes. Um, and then as we've been hearing from our agencies, they, they apply that to a, a wide variety of projects uh, and they, they help fund them for our larger regional projects down to uh, smaller maintenance and rehab projects. Um, so so the, the, play, the role they play is as a funding component for the most part in, in the plans that we're working on. Yeah, yeah. I kind of did already know the answer. I just wanted to bring it up that there are several things that uh, Measure T, other than just roads, um, does have funding for and does participate in, so thank you. Right, the current measure has, um, has dedicated uh, funding um, allocated to various modes of transportation. So we'll be looking at those as we start to look and see how they might, might be adjusted uh, for the future. And I will say, to, um, uh, we just had at MCTC, uh, Caltrans uh, did a presentation for us of the Clean California grant um, that uh, if we needed a match uh, and uh, county staff is already working on uh, putting forward the uh, Lavinia Mobility Study um, to apply for those grant funds, um, uh, you know, a match could be made through Measure T as well as the repaving project that uh, we did um, last year. Um, Funds from Measure T were a part of that uh, through the um, road maintenance fund. So um, it does get out to, um, to our, as well as in Ripperton and um, and um, you know, not not just those areas, but uh, Eastside Acres, same thing. Um, so uh, these funds are utilized in um, in all different communities within the county. Are there any other questions uh, for item two? If not, uh, we'll move on to item three. Great, thank you. Um, this chart uh, matrix provides you with. Um, an idea of what some of the other self-help counties are doing uh, across the state of California. Uh, we did not include those self-help counties, three counties that um, have a population greater than 2.5 million, which include uh, Los Angeles, uh, the San Diego region and Orange County. Um, but you can see the Madera County Transportation Commission in the, um, in the lighter blue at the top. Uh, it shows how the uh, me current Measure T dollars are allocated to each of the different uh, funding programs. As we just mentioned, there are set-asides for alternative forms of transportation. So currently about 51% goes to the regional streets and highways, um, about 44% to local transportation, 2% um, to transit, 2% to environmental enhancement projects, and then 1% to administration. Um, when you look at the remainder of the state and how each of those other um, organizations are allocating their funding, uh, they also, uh, with their more, over the last 20 years, these funding programs have become more multimodal. There are a few um, of the rural counties. So if you look at the rural counties uh, consistent with uh, Madera County's population, um, for instance, Imperial County Transportation Commission, about 20, about 92% of their funds goes to local, goes to the local agencies for, um, to, for allocation to their various improvements, um, their transportation needs. If you look at Napa Valley, 99% goes to local transportation. And then in San Benito, um, similar to Madera, it's about 49, almost 50% to regional and about 45% to local. So for the counties that match up to Madera, uh, the allocations are very similar. When you start to look at the medium-sized population counties, uh, they start to get a little more diverse in terms of how they allocate their funds to the various modes. And then the most diverse in some cases are those that are the larger uh, population groups of over 750,000. So with that, uh, I'm, I'm uh, available to answer any questions and I'm sure uh, MCTC and MCTA staff are as well. 
this is just really good information to have as we start to move forward to identify the programs that should be included in the next Measure T um, and will help us uh, make those allocations to those various modes. Uh, Tim and then Madeline. Yeah, um, thanks. This is really good to see. Um, it's interesting that Madera County is the only Central Valley County, County that doesn't have any dollars allocated to active transportation. Uh, what, it, what would be included under active transportation? What would be some examples? Well, they, they actually do have um, some active transportation, but it's, it's called out, I believe, in, under environmental enhancement. So it's a sub program of the environmental enhancement category. Um, some of the types of active transportation improvements include trails, bikeways, pedestrian improvements. Uh, so anything where you're walking or riding a bicycle, um, that's okay. what's included under active transportation. Thanks, Georgina. And uh, right now under Madera County's plan, uh, the environmental enhancements, is that essentially the same thing or, or what is included under that category right now under our current plan? You know, I have to look at the expenditure plan. Let me ask Troy. Troy, can you? Yeah. yeah. Is, 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 are the bikeways contained under environmental enhancement? I can't remember. It's just been a long time since I've looked at it. Uh, it it's been a few weeks. So if you could elaborate a little bit on what's under environmental enhancement uh, for us, that would be great. Yep. So that category is set up to is kind of a catch all for any project that would enhance air quality, uh, enhance and have environmental benefits. And so it could be uh, reducing emissions. Uh, it, I know some of our agencies have used Measure T environmental enhancement funds to match to as a match for their uh, congestion mitigation, air quality, federal fund projects. Um, and some of those aren't necessarily um, bicycle projects or pedestrian projects. Sometimes they're uh, reducing dust uh, type projects and uh, and improving our air quality. And so the catch is it's kind of a catch all. Uh, for any of those type of projects. And, um, you know, I think it's obvious, I think to all of us looking here is that's something we maybe we wanna consider is have maybe having a more um, clear uh, allocation for ATP type projects going forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would agree. I think that environmental enhancement bucket is really important. Um, but as you're describing it, Troy, I, I do see things like, you know, walking paths and bike trails and that stuff being, it's important to separate that out and make sure that kind of stands alone as a priority in and of itself. So, and thanks. that's something that's something definitely we'll be looking at. We're looking at that in other areas as well. So it's something that if there's a standalone category for it, it's real easy and it can't be misinterpreted. Yeah. So okay. Hey, Georgina, this is Dylan, and I just wanted to reiterate what was mentioned in a few of the presentations earlier that some of the streets and roads projects do right. have a component that addresses the conditions of, of the shoulders or sidewalk facilities attached to those roads in, in some cases as well. So there right. is a little overlap in the way some of the, those projects can be applied uh, to more uh, complete street type of projects. Right, we mentioned that last month as well. So please keep, in, keep that in mind. Um, when the county and the cities are upgrading those facilities, uh, they often include bikeways and uh, course sidewalks, curbs, gutters uh, as a part of those projects. It's also important to note that even when doing the um, uh, comparison to the uh, what would be rural counties or counties that are in the Central Valley, um, we are very different in that we only have two cities to cover a lot of that and a very widespread rural um, uh, area that that makes some of these projects uh, harder, um, but in the areas where we can do them, uh, they definitely uh, need to be uh, incorporated and, and done. Um, Madeline? Thank you. Um, yeah, I wanna uplift everything Tim Curley just mentioned. Um, I, I mean, environmental enhancement, it's currently 2%. We know the San Joaquin Valley is one of the most polluted air basins in the United States. So for air quality improvement projects to just be 2% of the local transportation dollars doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, and I just want to uplift, you know, everybody else who's been um, sharing that it would be good to have more dedicated to active transportation infrastructure and public transit. Um, and I don't know if this is the right time to ask this question, but I had this question with 
the prior agenda item and also with this one i'm just a little bit curious about like what is happening with the feedback that steering committee members provide during the steering committee because i know we haven't like voted on anything um and so if we're not making decisions here i'm just curious where the decisions are getting made and like what our role is exactly there haven't been any decisions that have been made what we're trying to do with these first few meetings is to bring you up to speed as to what are the transportation needs in the county what was what was measure a what did it do what was measure t what does it involve how is it being implemented and then what are the transportation needs for each of the jurisdictions and for caltrans so we're really trying to bring everybody up to speed get everybody on the same playing field and then the next step and you'll see this in the um, calendar that we'll bring up uh, toward the end of the agenda, uh, is uh, the next step will be to start work, now that you've had this background information on what are the needs and what does the current measure consist of, we'll be looking at starting to develop and identify the programs. It, will it be the same slate as what you see here from Madera County? It may not be. And, and, and for sure, we're, we will be looking potentially at an active transportation category. So, you know, it's it will be the discussion uh, in in December and in January to start to focus on what should these programs be, what should these silos be, and what should the allocations be. The next step would be to then once we've established those programs or these silos, then how much of the measure C dollar should go into each one. That's the second step. The third step then will be to look at the implementing guidelines. How should each one of these programs be implemented over the next 20 years or during the 20 year measure or 30 year measure or whatever the time frame may be? So right now we're just all in an information gathering mode and uh, we're bringing you along so that you can also understand exactly what the state of transportation is in Madera County. And then uh, Nicole and Jason, I saw that your hands were up. Uh, did it go down these? Because uh, I had Nicole, I had you after Ellen, and then Jason after you. Did you still have a question after? No, I would just reiterate. Um, it's, this is a really great grid to see. Um, we've talked a lot about transportation. One of the the biggest issues for our patients, you know, we see over fifty thousand patients. A major, a, a huge number of those patients are walking, and safety issues, and some of those. Even when we're taking our mobile units out into rural communities, we're still seeing walking take place um, into to access the care. And so putting a little bit larger percentages towards active transportation and environmental, um, I think is something definitely that I just wanted to reiterate because that's been one of our, our biggest complaints from patients is transportation. And we've done a lot around providing ways for our patients to get there if they don't have safe transportation instead of walking um, because they don't come to their visits and they um, don't aren't compliant with their healthcare needs and their health and their living when they have to walk to some of our places. And so safety is a big concern for them and, and for our staff as well. So I just, I wanted to reiterate and I put my hand down because I felt like everyone said that. So. Okay, no, perfect. I, but having that input is important, so thank you. Uh, Ellen, and then uh, Jason, uh, right after. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I kind of wanted to point out, I raised my hand a little while ago after Tim's question, but, um, and I know that the chart is showing um, these percentages and, and they kind of had to limit the definitions on them, but um, the local transportation pot isn't exclusive to roadways and paving. Right. And we've noted, you know, we've put in sidewalks um, and bike lanes, but actually um, when we were running short of funds for our major trail project, we just built, that was a million dollar project. We had to tap into that source of measure T because trails are a big component of the network. So, um, you know, we still have a few years left under this current measure and maybe we, um, can be a little more creative in how we use those pots if that's helping to tell a story that people um, are more of a story what people are looking for. So it's just the great, the needs are so great. It's just hard to, to switch that allocation sometimes. Right. That's it. Yeah, 
And I was just going to kind of reiterate that on um, what Ellen had said, just because it says 44% local transportation doesn't mean that it all goes to that. I mean, we use it for uh, CMAC, uh, you know, congestion mitigation, air quality projects, ATP projects, safe routes to school projects. Um, and so uh, getting hung up on the 2% for environmental enhancement um, doesn't really paint the full picture of, of what we actually use those funds for. Right. Local transportation means just that. It means all forms of transportation. So there is a flexible category. Um, and then, of course, there's a, a separate subprogram for maintenance. But the local agencies have discretion to use those funds as needed. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I've got uh, John Reed and then Sarah Boss. Yeah, I um, I think all of the presentations have been great, and I think the facts are really what we have to go on. And and but the idea is is that all of us on here want to, or I believe all of us on here want to see this thing passed. And I haven't heard much talk about the uh, besides the facts, the presentation, the marketing of it, and uh, how that that planning should be beginning now also. Uh, because there's going to have to be a budget and there's going to have to be a, a regional plan and a, and a countywide plan uh, for for marketing this and selling it to the to the so not just I mean explaining it certainly with what you need the facts but you also have to sell it and I think that 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 effort I haven't heard talked about maybe I've missed it but uh, yeah we uh, yeah John, we we're, yeah we're starting off this to to try and kick off uh, See what it's done, uh, what it needs to do in the future, um, and then uh, when we have a, a something that we can sell, then figure out how to sell it. Is that correct? Yeah, and we're we're actually our sub consultant TBWBH Props and Measures. They will be responsible for the public engagement as it relates to this process. So they have uh, prepared a public engagement outline. They've identified strategies. They'll be working with Dylan and as he uh, updates the regional transportation plan because these two projects kind of go hand in hand with each other. Um, the projects that are we're gonna be considering are those projects that, have, that will be considered as part of the regional transportation planning process. So that outreach effort uh, will, be, um, will be combined with what they're doing so that we can get out to all of the communities and the jurisdictions and inform the public about uh, this measure and how it's being developed. All right. Well, I think how that how that is presented to them should be something that's just not left in the hand of a consultant who may not necessarily know the particular neighborhoods and their attitudes. Uh, I think that there's local steering committees that could be a big part of that, and uh, volunteer, you know, or community, local community organizations that could take part in that. Uh, and yes, we'll definitely. Yeah, John, you're the, you're the chair for Eastern Madera County. So thank you for raising your hand. Just, just <laughs> and, and they will be working. They'll be working with uh, the, the community-based organizations. They'll be working with um, MCTC and their outreach program. So they'll be uh, working very closely and making sure that they can get as much outreach out there in the communities as possible. Right, Sarah? I have um, two quick points. Uh, I of course, support uh, all of the comments with regards to active transportation, as you might expect, but I think public transportation needs to be in the mix of that as well with regards to um, air quality and um, getting people some, some distances that are out of reach for walking. Um, and also, I just wanted to mention, like, I, I really understand having um, money put into categories that are flexible, but when um, I think we need to really have a balance between um, the flexibility that's needed for smaller counties to be able to address needs as they come up and things like that. And that could also be benefiting an active transportation project that wasn't conceived until later. And, and I get that. But we also need to have the balance of the transparency of prioritizing projects that the community is expecting over what are perceived as just utility kind of maintenance projects, if that makes sense. Um, so if we could balance that and be a, a little bit more explicit in our next plan around what specific active transportation and public transportation projects we're going to be taking on, I think that would be really good. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. 
And uh, Measure T is not the the only funding uh, that we use for uh, ATP or public transportation. Um, the cities and county it, it does augment it, but it's not the only um, money that is is for those uses. I think that's important to to note that um, it is a component of this, and it's an important component of it, but it's not the only funding source for it. Uh, any other questions? I don't see any, so um, I don't see any in the chat. So we'll move on to item four. Great. So I'll just introduce this item and then turn it over to MCTC staff. Um, the next step in this process is to uh, understand um, what the what the regional um, transportation needs are throughout Madera County. You heard from each of the local agencies, the city of Chowchilla, the city of Madera and Madera County, and what they what their needs are, specific needs. They've identified some roadways, some transit facilities, some bike, bike pedestrian improvements. Um, what we'd like to present to you today is what are the future transportation projects and programs? What are the, what are the costs associated with those? And, um, and, and do that by mode so that you get a sense of uh, what the need is for each of these different modes, given the funding sources um, that will be eventually available for each of these modes. So right now we've, we've prepared a graph um, that we're gonna get into in just a few minutes that identifies the, the projects and program costs or funding needs by mode. Um, we presented you with uh, some of the funding source information at the last meeting. And uh, of course, when you compare the two, there'll be a shortfall and we're gonna get into that the next meeting. We're gonna provide you with an overview of what the shortfall is by mode. Um, so I'm going to turn over to Troy McNeil with uh, MCTC and MCTC, MCTA staff, and he's going to provide you with an overview of the transportation costs and funding needs by mode. Troy? Thank you, Georgina. Troy McNeil, I'm the uh, Deputy Director Fiscal Supervisor here at MCTC, and I'm involved in all the financial aspects uh, from accounting to financial elements on the regional transportation plan, anything to dealing with numbers or finances or funds that I'm involved in some way. Um, so qu real quickly, we just wanna give you a brief overview and, uh, and continue what Georgina introduced. Um, so on your screen here is, uh, let me start, I guess, with the numbers um, over here on the right. Um, so we, part of our job here is to do a regional transportation plan every four years. And in that plan, we, uh, take a look at all the possible revenues and make reasonable assumptions of what revenues may be available to fund transportation projects in all modes. And we presented that number, as Georgina indicated last number, that available funding of uh, without Measure T would be about 714 million. Um, and then as part of the uh, preparation of the 2022 RTP, uh, regional transportation plan, a project prioritization study was uh, under Ergon, which is previously talked about today. And in that we identify projects from all the agencies, Caltrans, County of Madera, City of Madera, and City of Chowchilla, uh, across all the modes. And we put them into this database and they were scored and prioritized. So we are still in the process of identifying all the costs and verifying the costs and limits of all those projects. But so as of today, this is what we have. Some of these numbers may change as we continue to analyze this information as we continue to work on and prepare our regional transportation plan. But as of today, we in that database, we show by these different modes, the, those needs uh, from aviation, active transportation, transit, maintenance, mobility enhancement, and other operational type projects. Um, and those are listed there. And so we're showing uh, in our database, a project database of all projects that have been uh, um, uh, nominated or that our modeling show is needed of uh, about $2.7 billion uh, of transportation cost need. And so there's a little bit of, of a, of a fun shortfall there. And, and next meeting, we'll go into a little more detail on some of this information. But the, the pie chart there or the graph there on, on the left shows the breakdown kind of by mode um, by percentage wise. And so about 35% is needed for mobility enhancement, 
27% for maintenance, 16% for operational type projects, 12% for transit, 9% for active transportation, 1% for aviate, from aviation. And just to reiterate, these projects that were put in the database came from all of the, the past 2018 regional transportation plan. It came from our active transportation plan that was also ad uh, adopted in 2018. It also looks at our short range transit plan and all of our other planning documents and any other projects that are our agencies and jurisdictions nominated were included in this uh, database. And so um, I'm available for any, any, any uh, big picture questions and we'll get more on these details at the next meeting. And I uh, just wanted to hand it off to Dylan to talk about more about the RTP and how it relates to uh, these projects. Well, one thing I, one thing I wanted to add before uh, we move to Dylan is that for the maintenance, we did not have the information related to the pavement management systems from the agencies. So now that we do have some figures from them, that maintenance cost will probably go up. Uh, we'll we'll need to work with them to identify what those costs might be over the next uh, twenty five years or so, and um, make sure that that maintenance category uh, accurately reflects what their needs are. Yeah, and, and just piggyback on your comment, Georgina, and then that's kind of what I, the the, uh, the disclaimer here is some of these numbers may change as we uh, receive more more information as we uh, analyze and over the next two or three months, uh, we will see some changes. Right. And also the maintenance will go up as capital projects go in because you would have more to maintain. Um, so the, um, in terms of this, uh, Troy, this funding shortfall, what time frame it, does that represent? Because we're not in a yeah. uh, $2 billion shortfall every year. So if yeah, so that's, that's a good question. So part of our regional transportation plan go, will go out to our planning horizon is the year 2046 for the current plan we're working on. And we have to put together what's called a constrained list. And so what all the funding we show uh, could be reasonably be available, we have to show on our constrained list only those projects that we can fund. And then we have an unconstrained list. And so a lot of these projects that, you, that will be in our database will be on our unconstrained list because we just don't have the funding to, to implement them. And, and so these are all projects in our database that, like I said, have been nominated or in our current plans that, uh, that is showing is, needs to be done at some point. Thank you. Uh, Tim? Yeah. Uh, let's see, the available funding, I'm guessing that doesn't include any current Measure T funding since this Correct. is built out through 2046. Correct. Okay. This, okay. This is all, all funding uh, except for Measure T. Okay, super. And then um, I had the same question that popped up in the chat. What is mobility enhancement? Mobility enhancement is uh, capacity increasing projects for the most part. Okay. Those are where we're adding lanes. So we're going from two to four lanes along a corridor. That's yeah. what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Not, thank you. Not, not dance class, Tim. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Madeline? I'm going to be honest. I wish it was dance classes rather than <laughs> capacity expanding <laughs> projects, as you know. Um, but my question was what's aviation? Aviation, those are projects that were submitted by the city of Madeira for its airport. It owns a public use, um, public owned airport in Madeira. And so those are projects, uh, they might be runway enhancement projects, um, lighting projects, et cetera. The city of Chowchilla also has an airport. Uh, that's plan. true, that's true. City of Chowchilla also does, yes. So those are costs for public use, publicly owned uh, airports in the county. That was from Jared's uh, slide where we're going, we don't need roads, right? Everyone's gonna have flying cars. <laughs> All right, uh, so we got uh, one answer from Jeff in the chat. Um, and uh, any more questions on this? Wait, um, so then we'll move on to... Yes, so Dylan. So Dylan is going to present uh, us with an overview of the regionally, um, the regionally significant transportation systems within the county coming from the current uh, regional transportation plan for 2018. So Dylan. Thank you, Georgina. So you might've heard of a few of the presentations earlier mentioned regionally significant roadway or system 
it's something uh, as part of our regional transportation development, uh, our regional transportation plan development, we actually look at a lot. Uh, a requirement of our RTP uh, is that we analyze the impacts at a region-wide level in the long term. And we do that uh, in a large part by assessing the conditions on our regionally significant roadway network. That makes up our main arterials, collectors, highways, our, our, our busiest and most utilized facilities as it's used by automobile traffic, which is a very important thing that we measure in this plan uh, as required by the state and federal government. And what we're measuring ultimately is what the impacts are of that travel as it relates to tailpipe emissions or, or other uh, particulates and other uh, essentially pollution that is caused by travel activity in automobiles. Um, so we don't look at every single every single road, every single country dirt road or every back alley in that process, but we do look at our most utilized facilities by automobiles in that process. And a lot of the product our projects that we've looked at uh, are projects that are on that network. Uh, the ones that would have the most impact uh, would generally be on the state highway system, which you know obviously have uh, a, a large number, up to 80,000 daily traffic users per day on State Route 99, uh, but also the other key facilities. Um, we have identified a, a slew of different projects throughout the long-term planning period, many of which we've talked about today. Those have been projects that have been part of our previous RTPs or are still part of our RTPs going forward. Uh, the RTB projects uh, through many, iter many iterations of this plan have stayed the same because it is a long range plan and we do uh, regularly update it every four years. So it's only the, the projects in that short four year window that come to completion and, and are removed. So every plan, there's a lot of the same projects and then the new projects added. Uh, and those projects can change based on changes in our policies, changes in our goals, changes in the vision we have for the future of our community. And that's been changing uh, more and more lately as uh, our goals you know, locally, statewide, and federally do change. Um, we can go on to the next slide, please. So this gives you an idea of some of what those most significantly regional uh, projects are in our long-term plan. As identified uh, through the plan that we, we collaborate with the cities, uh, with Chowchilla, Madera, and with the county jurisdiction to, to identify what those key projects are uh, that they believe have the most important need to address the, the, the concerns or uh, any issues in their communities as far as travel goes. Next slide, please. Uh, another component of what we're looking at in this RTP is how, do, how, is the, how does the public transit system perform? More importantly, how do we keep it funded and keep it going through both capital and maintenance or capital and operation investment? Um, this plan looks all the way out to the very end of it as well for that. Even though conditions can change, uh, the, the direction of those investments can change as we've been talking about in our previous items where we looked at the shares between the different um, uh, aspects of the measure itself. Uh, that happens with this as well, uh, with transit. So we, we project out every year operations and, and uh, capital for our transit systems. And as we update this every four years, they change each iteration of this project. So there's uh, potential for new projects and, and new directions for this to take in each plan. Uh, we also mentioned that we have an active transportation plan that was completed uh, in 2018, which uh, we're going to be updating pretty soon in the future. But uh, similar to what I mentioned with the RTP, there's a lot of plan or there's a lot of projects within this plan that we want, still want to focus on implementing now. Uh, even as we move forward to update it, update that and identify some new projects uh, that can be beneficial. Uh, this this is a, an important plan. It's important for us to be able to implement a lot of the key projects in this plan that can help uh, get people out of their cars and within their communities walking or biking around or having better walking and biking access to the transit connections that are available to them. Uh, we we align uh, what we what we talk about in this plan the best we can with some of the state programs that are offering more funding each year as we're seeing right now, especially towards these type of projects. Uh, so there is an active transportation, grant, uh, active transportation program at the state that we'd love to see something like Measure T be a better partner towards uh, being a partner with that, that funding program for the state. 
you know, ultimately we want the state to look at us and our projects like the ones we have in the ATP and say, this is a good partner for our funds. Um, and that's what we're, we'd like to see achieved, not just through the, our, our RTP, but something like the measure as well. That's a, that's a big help for something like that. Um, and, each, and again, that was a, a region-wide plan as well. Each community, there was an extensive list of projects we identified, and we did ad identify some prioritization criteria to really try to get the best projects to rise to the top in that process. Um, so the RTP really, it collects everything. It's, it's, it's a catch-all for all of our transportation projects. And in the long range, there's a lot of factors we look at too about how we grow, how many, how, what's our population going to be in 25 years? And, and where are they gonna be? Where are they gonna live? And where are they gonna work? Uh, and how are they going to coexist with our existing populations? Uh, so there's a, a lot of factors and interconnect, interconnected factors that play a part in our land uses, our growth, and how we get to and from the places we need to go. And very importantly, as we're discussing all here today, how do we fund it? How do we reasonably have a, a realistic funding approach to, to meet our challenges are ahead of us and achieve our goals? So that's the, the purpose of our plan. And it really interconnects in, in so many ways with Measure T that being such an important aspect of our community investing in itself. So with that, I would, that was kind of a very nutshell version of, of some of the things we look at in the RTP, uh, but it, it is all very connected to a lot of the things we're talking about. So I take any questions if any, any has, anyone has them. Again, and that's the regional plan that uh, is facilities that are used as a region, not just as just our community, correct? Yes. Are there any questions for Dylan regarding that? Thank you for that presentation, Dylan. All right, item six, where do we? Yes, Rose is going. Yeah. So Rose is, uh, we had this item on the agenda last month. And for those committee members who were in attendance, they provided us with an overview of what their priorities will be for, or might be for the new Measure T renewal. And so Rose facilitated that process. I'm gonna turn it over to Rose. Hopefully that we have additional members who weren't here last month. And uh, she's also contacted some of them. Uh, so she's got some additional reporting to provide to us, Rose. Thanks, Georgina. Uh, this is Rose with CRPA. Um, just so you know, what we're going to be doing with this information is put together a matrix so all of the members can see what the top priorities are and it can be shared with the committee as you move forward in the process. So for those of you that weren't in attendance last month, or for those of you that didn't have an opportunity to share your top three priorities with us, we put this together in a matrix. I've sent you an email, some of you have responded. Some of you, I will send a reminder and ask you to respond, but I was hoping maybe we could get two of you to respond today, uh, just so that you could share your top three priorities. Um, I think Nicole started to share some of her priorities. If you want to share a little bit more, um, Nicole with the Camarena Healthcare Center, um, you talked about walking, mobility, and the safety needs of some of your constituents. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I think the the walking, mobility, safety, um, sidewalk safety, roads, and like a lot of the complaints is lighting as well, because we do have after hours care. And, um, you know, we try to, but it's not necessarily near our facilities, it'd be them walking home and the safety of that. So I think that probably covers quite a bit. Um, also alternative transportation opportunities, um, which we we work on and um, apply for grants um, that will help offset costs for our patients to have alternative transportation. Um, we are also looking into providing transportation for patients to and from, which would help with some of that safety. But a lot of it is, um, the road safety access, um, pedestrian crossings, that is the biggest complaint with our staff, our employees, our 500 employees, and the majority of them are in downtown Madeira, is crossing back and forth over Yosemite. Um, 
and trying to do that safely. And a lot of them walk back and forth and are carrying information and resources. And so and that's always been a struggle for them. But um, I, I think those would be some of our, our bigger areas off the top of my head. Great. If you think of any others, uh, you can email those to us and we'll include that in the matrix. And then uh, one other person that I had sent an email to that had, didn't have a chance to respond um, is, um, is Mike Lopez still on the phone with Central Cal California Labor Council? You wanna share your top three with us? see him. He get off? Yeah, I don't I uh, left. Yeah, yeah, I don't see him, his name on here anymore. Okay. Um, okay, well, we'll just end because I know we have a lot of other stuff to get through today. And I'll just resend uh, the email to all of you that didn't have a chance. And um, thank you for your participation. And I look forward to continuing to work with you. And it, it's really important that we have a sense of where you're coming from. Um, and that's why this matrix will be helpful to see exactly how the committee, how each of you stand as it relates to your priorities for the next measure. Thank you, right. Michael. Let's see if Michael has to leave the meeting. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, I think and it, it is important. I think when we look at this too, um, uh, I don't know, do we have any, um, any studies or anything on areas where active transportation um, is able to um, be implemented and where it's extremely difficult. Um, I think that would be good to, to look at, to know that our uh, urban areas versus our rural areas and, but there are areas in our rural areas that, that do have the capability, I think, um, so when we're looking at it, we're going to spend those funds making sure that uh, we get it to where it uh, it's needed and and uh, utilized, because um, it would be hard to make it a condition of every project that we have, um, and, and not wise use of funds. But uh, where there's areas that it can be used, I don't know if we have any studies like that. But I think that'd be important to to make some uh, uh, to distinguish it. Yeah, your your active your regional active transportation plan did look at critical areas where facilities or improvements are needed. Dylan or uh, Tricia, do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I can. Uh, as part of the ATP, I mentioned there was a prioritization process, and some of the things I did consider were some of what what the identified barriers would be, and a lot of those on a cost basis. Uh, Acquiring right away, or uh, if uh, if there were any construction barriers, um, any other elements that might impact the cost effectiveness, uh, in might of the benefits. Uh, so there was a balancing of that, so, so to speak, within the prioritization process. However, each project uh, did have, uh, you know, some of those factors considered, uh, a cost estimate, and so on. That that gave us an idea of you know, what the projects are and could be still. And we can, as always, be looking for ways uh, to innovate our approach towards funding them. And it also, also, it, it also looked at accident. It also looked at accident information. So where accidents have happened um, so that they could determine whether or not there was need for a, a project at a particular location. So that was also considered. And sometimes when you look at mobility enhancements, it's not just adding, uh, like adding capacity through uh, walking facilities as well as uh, bike facilities as well, right? That would be right. mobility enhancement. You know, with, with the right mindset, you know, a good bike path or, or sidewalk is capacity increasing, but just of a different mode. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but so, when, like I said, we want to implement that plan the best we can with our partners, uh, and we want to update it to be even stronger as a partner for, for state funding in the future and federal funding. Uh, that's what Measure T has the potential to, to boost that with by showing our community is willing to invest itself for projects like that. And Ms. Chair, uh, Troy included a link in the chat for a copy of our ATP, and then also it's included on our website for those that would like to view it. 
Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, next steps. Okay, Tricia, do you have any uh, staff items you would like to bring up today? Okay, so you jumped on way faster than I am. You're way quicker. To the <laughs> mic. Um, so I was going to say in the interest of time, I do not have anything unless Georgina did. So <laughs> okay. there you go. The only thing that I wanted to bring uh, to you each month that I that we have these meetings is just to give you a, a heads up on what's what's coming up in the future um, as it relates to the steering committee. So we've completed the first uh, three meetings, um, September, October, and November. We're moving pretty good, a pretty good clip. So this is great. Um, the next meeting, we mentioned that we wanted to review the funding shortfall percentage by mode. Um, if it's available from the uh, 2022 RTP SCS process, if it isn't, then that will move over to January. Uh, uh, we will also uh, bring you back uh, with a public engagement update so that you can uh, hear what's going on to engage the public and to ensure that we're receiving input from the public as this process moves forward. Um, if we're not able to bring you the shortfall percentage by mode in December because it falls from the work, uh, the, the work that's being done with the regional transportation plan, then it will be in January and it'll be in that, at that point when we will initiate um, the program development. So looking at that matrix of, of all of the various different types of um, measure programs uh, around the state and looking to see how we're going to craft this measure for the future. Um, as we start to move out, as I mentioned, there are three major tasks to development of the, um, of the plan. And that includes identifying those programs, then identifying the allocations that should go to each one of those programs, what percentage of the measure C proceeds should go, excuse me, measure T proceeds should go to each one of those, um, those programs or sub programs, and then the implementing guidelines. So we've got a lot of work to do. It's going to get exciting as we start to move forward. It's also going to be very important for everyone to, to be at these meetings, because this is the point where we start to talk about the programs and how much of the Measure T funds go to each of those programs. Uh, so your involvement is going to be critical from this point forward. Great, and then uh, Georgina, I don't know if you saw in the chat, but uh, Tim had asked if uh, this slide could be sent out to everybody. Just so, and I think that'd be a good idea so people can kind of uh, get ready for what's coming next. Yeah, and as soon as we know uh, whether or not we're going to be looking at that shortfall by, by uh, per, shortfall percentage by mode uh, in December, we'll, we'll send it out once we have a, a good handle on what we're going to be presenting in December at the December meeting. Thank you so much. And I see uh, Supervisor Poitras put his hand up because he saw that I was getting too close to ending the, uh, the meeting before the 3.30 dime. Exactly. Well, what I was gonna say is that, uh, Georgina, you mentioned that it's important for uh, everybody to be on the meetings from this, uh, from here on out, which is, is absolutely true. And I appreciate everybody's attendance, uh, but who's not hearing what you're saying are those who never called in today. So uh, okay. what we need to do is to somehow get the message out to those folks uh, that their participation is, uh, that it's really important that they participate. So I think that we need to uh, focus on them as well. Yeah, I think an email to each one of those would be in order. The other thing that we have been talking about uh, is to start making phone calls and reminding them, even though they get a link reminder in email, go ahead and give them a call at least a day or two before the meeting to remind them that this is coming up and how important it is for them to be involved. Right. Gotcha, thank you. Uh-huh. Okay, and so Georgina, there's the next item is a committee vacancy. I believe we still have one vacancy and that's under Gintz Movement. And so we continue to march forward and trying to make connections with a representative that would be available for Bismuth. I, I take it they haven't responded because they're very busy, right? With the supply chain issues. And <laughs> right. they don't do to us. Um, so, uh, I think I'll be working with our co-chairs to see if we can figure out something on that end. And then the next meeting is, uh, you just showed up on the screen, December 16th. There is a slight conflict with the 1.30 time. Not sure if we can move to 2 p.m. There's the state of the county, um, uh, state of the county. Yes, yeah, is that what you call it, guys? State of the county address. Yeah. 
um, which does not end until 1.30. And so we just need time to run back to our offices and get onto our computers in time to log on for this meeting. Well, a lot of us will just be there. Maybe we'll just get a live link and just do it straight from uh, the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, so yeah, two, two o'clock should work that time. Uh, so the next meeting will be December 16th. Uh, moving on to the last item is uh, public comment. Uh, any members of the public wishing to make comment on any items or, uh, not on our agenda? Please do so or on the agenda. I see none on the chat. I see none up here so with that two minutes early yes great and thanks everyone for your pr presentations today the cities and the county did a wonderful job and so did mctc very and thankful thank, thank you for the engagement from everyone in the uh on the panel as well we really appreciate uh, all of your input and uh this only make this uh, that much better by having this input from such a wide variety of uh, uh groups here so thank you all have a happy Thanksgiving, uh, enjoy you your too. families, and uh, we'll see you in December. Thank you so much. Thank Bye you. everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye.